good evening today we welcome to the webinar on overcoming concrete durability challenges with a multidisciplinary approach by a young engineer uh, mr engineer kalinda dasanayaka he is a chemical engineer from university of peradeniya and he has uh, experience in uh, started his career in, in cement and uh, at the, he has done a lot of work at in, in cement with respect to he has started with uh, initially with process development side on the concrete uh, product production process in, in operations and so on of course and also process operations with respect to energy saving kiln operation and various uh, modifications in the event control systems so he has uh, he went to the uh, nc head office headquarters in switzerland and he obtained some experience i think 6 months or so uh, in uh, kiln operations and uh, cement manufacturing processes then he moved on to from the process uh, process development he moved on to the product development on two cement uh, various cement applications various cement product development uh, areas so then after that then he moved on to the he had moved on to the customer uh, tailored uh, i mean customization of products with respect to concrete applications and uh, he has worked with uh, he has uh, then uh, he has they are at insi cement i think for 6 years thereafter he joined at uh, melsta gama uh, uh, which is a, a company importing cement and right now they are doing the uh, packaging operation in colombo and they are, i think they are planning to do the production as well and he is uh, right now as a <clears throat> technical head at the mesta gama and he has worked with uh, japanese society for promoting science uh, uh, for uh, various uh, hot weather concreting guideline preparations for asia and africa and he also has collaborated with uh, public and private organizations in in sri lanka Uh, like Colombo Port City, Astia Tower, New Calgary Bridge, Mini Canicut, Moragaha Kanda, Kalugunga Transfer Canal, Sambantota Harbour, Southern and Central Expressways, Yakamin Mills, Colombo Solid Waste Management Project, and so on, on developing uh, concrete for specific applications for uh, various uh, consumer customers. I call upon uh, Engineer Kalinda Dasanayaka to uh, proceed with the webinar. Thank you. Kalinda. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Actually, I tried to uh, start my video, but it's not working due to some, I think, with the technical issue. Can you see my screen now? Or... Is it possible that uh, you can see my screen or? Hello, Kalinda. Uh, shall I start, sir? Is it okay? Hello, can you hear me?
Anind, we can hear you properly. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, basically, uh, the topic is a bit of different than uh, the conventional civil engineering matter because uh, here basically I want to discuss about that the topic is uh, the overcoming concrete durability challenges with a multidisciplinary approach. So uh, it's, it's something that I am trying to uh, discuss about that how we can utilize our engineering know-how without uh, putting ourselves into the silo mentality uh, like civil engineers or chemical engineers or mechanical, electrical, whatever. Uh, without putting ourselves into the some silo mentality, I want to discuss that uh, how we can utilize our strengths, our core values, our core strengths in our engineering disciplines to help to overcome uh, challenges which other disciplines are facing. So uh, what I want to emphasize throughout my presentation is that we have to stop the fixing the symptoms, which is like that. If I have a fever, I will take a, a penadol, a paracetamol. It's like that. But we have to find out the real root cause without putting uh, or without treating only for the symptoms. We have to identify the root causes. Basically, for the root causes, there are a lot of other disciplinaries also engaging with the uh, with the some core engineering principles like uh, civil engineering or other disciplines. So. Basically, what I want to discuss here, how we can overcome the challenges what we are facing in the civil engineering field with the other disciplinaries, engineering fundamentals. So uh, I will try to do my best uh, not to be a boring for this because uh, here uh, I, I hope that the civil and the chemical both or the material engineers will be here. Uh, basically, I am discussing uh, all three dimensions, engineering in the civil, chemical, as well as the material. So I will try my best to deliver some sort of a Nutella bottle instead of a Marmite bottle. We said that I love it or hate it. So we'll try. Here, basically, uh, the ingredients of the presentation will be on the, the durability of concrete structures and the economical aspects. I will introduce the topic, uh, what is the importance and the significance of the topic. And then I will move to the, th move to, move to the th theories the behind on the deterioration of the concrete with utilization of other engineering disciplines like material, chemical engineering, material engineering, electrical as well with the civil. And uh, we'll discuss on the hydration of the conventional cement and associated drawbacks with that by putting ourselves into the, to the drawbacks and the phenomena of the engineering principle, it's, it will help us to, to develop solutions. By, by identifying better on the root causes that are hidden inside that uh, the reaction kinetics. Then we'll touch on the, the modes of deterioration of the concrete, their significance, measurements, how we can measure them, and what are the mechanisms that we can develop to avoid those repetitions. Basically, I will touch on the chlorination, carbonation, acidic exposure, sulfate, delayed ettringite formation, and thermal cracking and plastic shrinkage cracking. And then we'll move to the future directions, how we can develop our, how we can utilize our engineering know-how to overcome or to make uh, the world in a better place. So this is how I want to, to, to put my uh, steps during this presentation. So before jumping into the presentation, uh, we will touch just to get an idea of the present state of our construction in our country. We know that uh, this is a picture of uh, the dreaming picture of Port City. We expect it has to be like that. The, 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 our government, they have a streamlining the infrastructure development for the national development with the, the keen on the strategy to put the special development areas focusing the uh, in, industrial, the tourism, or likewise, and to provide relevant infrastructures and utilities to those areas. Basically, the most construction moving from horizontal to the vertical, it's, it's a one challenge. Another challenge is that since we don't have a required area, most of the construction now concentrating on the highly aggressive, either marine environment or the cat categorized as the hot and humid conditions, like hot weather concrete. In. And then uh, the expectation of those construction also getting changed than the previously the expectation was to build a structure which is having about 50 years of lifetime. Now it's moving towards more or less more than 100 years. So 
I will take some examples to show what are the you know, ongoing infrastructure projects of the country, the port city development, the Krishpia, very close to that port city. Though the port city, it's basically the re reclamation of land in the coastal area and high rises also development uh, in marine environments. We you know the exposure is different than a building which is we have built inside the core, in between the like candy, coronagula, the exposure condition, condition will be different than the conditions are in Colombo or other coastal areas. And then New Calendar Bridge, Mini Pianicates, roads and infrastructures. Those are, those are developing in marine and harsh exposure environments. So basically, as I described previously, the exposure conditions are getting changed from soft environment to very harsh condition. And the, uh, the durability expectations are getting changed. The challenge is that as engineers, how we can develop proper solutions to overcome the practical aspects of those projects. So then the all, all, most of the structures, as I've shown during the examples, most of them are reinforced concrete structures. Why the concrete are coming with the reinforced? Why it's not steel? There are a lot of features and advantages are coming with the concrete. We have to identify those advantages before moving towards the other things. There are economic aspects, yes. When we compare with the best competition of the concrete, it's steel. When compared with the steel, the concrete are still very cost effective. And when we compare with the resistance to the earthquake, hurricanes, rain, or insects, or a biological matters, those are very good. And we have proven results all over the world. And the resistance to different exposures are good because we know all over the world from, from Sahara Desert to Antarctic, there are a lot of concrete structures still uh, working well. And the stages of experience is quite good. So then why we discuss about the durability? This is the topic. The thing is that early believers the people who are engaging with the concrete industry, they believe that it's actually, it's engineering beliefs. We know that the, by itself, concrete, it's, it's, it's uh, after the reaction of the concrete, by itself, it's an alkaline material. Alkaline means it's having a higher pH, which is roughly about 12, 13, like that. So, and reinforcements are made with steel. So steels inside the alkaline environment, which is good. So people believe that due to that, that alkaline environment or the alkaline exposure condition inside the concrete will provide the sufficient, uh, uh, sufficient durability parameters for the particular reinforcement. So people believe that the concrete, reinforced, con reinforced concrete will be a magical material for the construction. It was a, they thought like that, but when the chain, when the, uh, the construction era is getting changed, we have identified it's not like that. Then, then the real scenarios came to the picture. I have taken this, uh, referring the uh, British standards of 8500, similarly BACA in 206. They have categorized concrete structures based on the exposure condition that could be the deterioration or deteriorated causes. They have five main categories, XC, XD, XS, XF and XA. If, I'm for, if I want to focus on my country, our condition, basically we have only three uh, exposure classes in our country for the particular uh, environments or the exposure based, which is uh, corrosion induced by carbonation, Corrosion induced by chloride from sea because we are not utilizing chlorides to remove snow because we don't have freeze and throw or snows and chemical attacks. So these three will be uh, the major exposure classes which we have to face in our country. Okay, then what is the importance of the durability? If we everybody know if the deterioration process in concrete it was happened, the result will be non-serviceability of structures. In extreme cases, it will collapse, causing lots of fatalities. So it will impact 
on the uh, on the safety of our own people. Not only that, it will hit to our economic aspects as well. So the structural, the serviceability of structural element will be a key topic which we have to focus in terms of the national development. I have took this literature to show you that we engineers usually, since I, I, I hope that the, the, the audience will be a different category. I mean, the civil will be here. They are very experts on the concrete and chemical and materials also I am expecting. Uh, so with that, more or less, just imagine that we are just uh, just civil personnels, not engineers. Just imagine that a civil person who wants to make a, his own house, do do he has uh, some idea about the durability? No, I don't think they having more or less the idea on this on the strength. They might don't have uh, an idea about the about the durability, basically the masons, they don't know about the, what are the aspects, what are the ingredients that could lead to a failure in the concrete, they don't know. So as engineers, we have to keen on that. It's, it doesn't matter whether we are dealing with concrete or not, it's a common sense. How we can develop a better concrete because it's a, it's a more or less like a very common product. I have took this from USA research and they have conducted the research to identify the serviceability of their concrete structures and found out most of the structures, even over 99% of the structures, they are very well in terms of the strength. They are having a relevant required strength even after a few decades, but still they, were, they are not managing to meet the required durability criteria. So that is the case. Meeting of the the required strength parameters for a particular project is not a challenge, but to meet the required parameters in the durability will be a real challenge. So we will discuss how we can utilize our engineering know-how, especially from the all over the engineering disciplines, not only the civil, but as well as other engineering disciplines well, we have lots of experiences, lot of theories have developed. So we'll try to gather them and to build a new structure, new framework to develop a new mechanism, new model to identify the durability aspects, how we can develop the durability, how we can improve the durability of the concrete in our country. I have took this example from the Thailand uh, during our visit in 2017. They had uh, highways like our uh, Southern Expressway. Also, we had the same issue, but I will not take that example, I will take it this from Thailand. It was constructed in 2002-2003 period at uh, Bangkok. At that time, it was about 15 years old and they identified some of the cracks. You can see here, there are cracks. Uh, it's like a, like a map. In civil engineers, they use the name of map cracking. And uh, ultimately, it was identified the crack was caused due to the delayed ettlingite formation. Don't, don't, don't mix the word. I will explain it in later stages of my presentation, what is called DEF, what is the mechanism of the DEF formation, how we can avoid that, we'll discuss it later. Just, you know, just to give an idea about the durability, importance of the durability, I will take that word. So uh, they were identified about 1,700 around of uh, pile caps were, were uh, were identified at DEF formed uh, file gaps. And from that onwards, they have identified another 200, which we have, which they have to put their eyes on the very, very severe manner because it was already in this stage of non-manageable. So what they did was, since it's an expressway and they can't remove them, and uh, it's, 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 since it's hitting more on their national budget or the national development, because to cross down uh, expressway is not a possible matter. They did some, uh, some repair works by introducing reinforcement with the external jacketing and putting online monitoring. It cost more than 5 billion rupees per annum. When we compared that, when we converted that bath, their currency into our currency, the cost was more than 5 billion. This is one case. In the right side, you can see a abundant building which is a cooling tower from a coal-fired thermal power plant, which also located close to the uh, Bangkok. It was abundant because after about 10 years of building, 
it was abandoned because of the uh, the collapse or identified structural failures which caused due to the alkali silica reaction so we'll come to later what is called alkali silica reactive so we will clear it out just to give you an idea the cost and abandonment the government doesn't want to make a structure and put it to an put it into a abandoned list within 10 years they want at least to get the, get their service for 50 years but it was happened so this is one example to identify the importance of the durability of concrete structures so these i have two from the japan you can see in the left side uh, in japanese they are doing assessment before before putting the national uh, budgeting they are they are identifying what are the areas or what are the roads this is much similar to our road development authority rda they also have the similar kind of a mechanism in their country so they have a very good man very systematic way to identify the areas or the bridges or concrete structures which they have to focus more they have categorized in three in three uh, colors red is very severe severe areas that has to be uh, cleared very soon otherwise it will be a catastrophe and then there is amber color section which is in the intermediate zone and the green section those are those are performing well so during that period i mean they in their engineering assessment it's an annual assessment they are conducting assessment to identify what are the areas which they have to put the red mark based on that they are planning based on the the availability of the budget whether they are doing the they are doing the, the repair works to get that red into the green zone or to the amber zone. Based on that, only they allocate their budgets. It's a very engineering, engineered, systematic manner to, to utilize the national economy. This is the one. So this is another one. So we already discussed about the, the importance of the durability. Now I will clear the topic. Durability, I have already cleared. Now the remaining part is that the multidisciplinary. I will take that now. So this is also I have took from the Asian Concrete Federation in Japan and from Hokkaido. So problem, you can see, I will play the video. You can see here, there is a moving, it's like a piston. You can see there is a gel, like a forming gel, which is actually not a gel. Yeah, yes, it is a gel, but it was formed from a concrete. Uh, it was modeled by putting about uh, 100,000 of cycle loads, which is much similar to the axial load uh, that put in by the vehicles, which is uh, transporting uh, on top of the bridge. So they have simulated the same kind of axial load to a concrete base to identify the phenomena. What could happen to that concrete when we put such kind of a, suppose that uh, concrete in a mic in a macroscopic level i mean our naked eye we can see it's like a like a like a very rough material but when we go into the microscopic level it's a porous material which is having some sort of a capillaries microscopic level capillaries small canals inside that material so it's usually it's filling with water with the treating and drying cycle it's it can absorb water from the surface and those capillaries usually are filled with water. Water, it's a fluid, we know. When we apply the pressure on top of a fluid, a fluid can transform or can distribute those pressure effectively throughout the porous medium. So what could happen with that force? We everybody know that the force can make a pressure. So with that pressure, with the with the it, in a cyclic manner, it's, it's like a fatigue force. It creates some sort of a gel kind of a material by reducing the strength of concrete with the time being. And they have identified this is a critical catastrophic failure that could lead to the failures in bridges. The cause, the problem is a civil engineering matter. Issue is coming with the durability of durability issue of the bridge with the pressure distribution along the capillary force of the concrete. It's a civil engineering matter. So the right side. This I have taken from the from the chemical engineers research. The topic is stress-dependent pore deformation effects on multi-phase 
flow properties of porous medium. It's the root cause. It was modeled to identify the, the purpose was to identify the petroleum extraction and carbon dioxide capturing purpose with porous medium. They have model, they have identified the phenomena, how the, the pressure is getting distributed among these uh, uh, forest structure or forest media, and they are doing their job with that. So civil engineers, they have identified that issue, but what do you think that if we can merge these two knowledge together, we can identify the real road cause, and similarly, we can address to that issue to overcome those kind of durability issues very easily. That side, I want us to emphasize during my presentation along the way, what is the importance of the multidisciplinary approach to overcome the durability challenges in the concrete? Actually, I have utilized, I have using this because I am working with concrete. It is not only for the concrete, but other industries as well. We can utilize this multidisciplinary approach. Okay, now I have cleared about my, uh, the topic. Now we will go to the topic. We'll discuss on the deterioration of concrete. Okay. So usually the reinforced concrete structures, they have a, a deterioration process, which can could which could lead due to the chemical issues, physical or mechanical issues, or biological or organic issues, and some other kind of free stressing or the stress-related matter. Basically, today I'm going to focus on these highlighted areas in DEF formation, alkali aggregate reaction chloride ingression, carbonation, external sulfate attack, a bit side, the acid attack, thermal cracking, shrinkage. We'll cover in uh, today. So before that, uh, initially I have shown you that I have expressed the, the, the exposure classes, how we can define exposure classes as for the V8850. So I will take an example to, to elaborate that it in a more brief manner. Okay, I will take an example. This is a this structure, which is like a bridge, which formed in the coastal area. You can see here, this is a splash. There is a tidal. This is a immersion uh, inside a coastal area, which is sea. And as per the previous categorization, this will come under the excess two class. It means permanently submerged in a marine environment. And this zone will come under the excess three category. It means tidal, splash, spray zones, which is also in the part of a marine structure. And then this is a, it's, it's, it's top of that marine structure, which is a coming under the excess one and excess four classes. Excess one means it's, it's exposed to air brown salt, but not direct contact with seawater. Sea and XC4 means uh, it's cyclic wet and dry concrete surface could subject to the water contact. So those are the, this is the way we can utilize those exposure classes to define our real world uh, structures, okay? Now, we can identify what are the deterioration mechanism that could link with those exposure classes in the first. They might have uh, structural failures due to the corrosion of reinforcement or due to the microbiological reaction that could uh, collapse or that could decay the concrete structure. And uh, in, the, in this zone, in the splash zone, there will be corrosion due to the chloride as well as there will be uh, erosion due to the mechanical forces which is coming in this tidal. And on top of the the areas on top from the above the sea level, there will be a corrosion due to chloride. Simultaneously, there will be a corrosion due to the carbonation, all both together. And throughout the structure, there is a possibility to have a internal sulfate attack or DEF, both are similar, or alkali aggregate reaction. Based deterioration could be happen based on their element sizes, as well as the uh, reaction kinetics, those things could be happen. Okay, so before discussing about these uh, topics, I will take one uh, one fundamental from chemical engineering, uh, which is 
the fundamentals on transport phenomena. But I have taken this to express how the concrete can be deteriorated. Usually the durability of concrete mainly depend on four, sometimes I could say plus one, uh, main modes of ingression of marine materials into the concrete. The first one is the permeability. It be usually permeability or penetratability both are similar, much similar, I would say rather. Uh, so it's, it's like a fluid that can uh, pass through a saturated concrete under an externally applied pressure which can be described by Darcy's law. It's engineering or physical law. We can easily describe that mechanism by Darcy's law. Adsorption. Adsorption means that, suppose that uh, uh, we are having a structure. Oh, not, not structure. Suppose that we are on a beach for about 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, if I lick my hand, I can feel salty, salt, salty taste because the salt has came with the sea breeze and it deposited on my skin. Similar thing could be happened to the structures as well. With the sea breeze, the salt, airborne salt will come with the sea breeze and that could be uh, adhes, adhes or adsorb to the surface of the concrete. We call it addition. Then absorption or capillary flow, both are similar. The process is that uh, any kind of a material, if it can absorb or it can uh, pass through a porous material due to the capillary suction, which is coming with the pore space available, we call it usually for the, for the, for the concrete, we call it water absorption uh, in unsaturated porous material due to the pressure differences, we call it capillary action it could lead to the gravitational forces as well. Then the diffusion. Diffusion means any kind of a material or foreign particle that could uh, penetrate into a material due to the concentration gradient. It means the changes in the, in the concentration. Likewise that uh, we everybody know that electrons are flowing inside a uh, conductive material due to the gradient of the, their voltage. Difference in the voltage. Similarly, due to the diffusion, the material or ion can exchange throughout the porous structure due to the concentration gradient because it's acting as a, a driving force. We call it diffusion. And sometimes there will be a diffusion plus reaction as well inside the concrete, usually it's called like a carbonation process. We'll discuss in later stages. Those are the key transport phenomena or mechanism that could uh, lead to a foreign particle ingression through a concrete or a porous medium. Okay, so measurement techniques. We have already discussed about the, about the, uh, the material transport mechanism, how a foreign material like a chlorine, uh, carbon or a sulfate, how they can pass through or how we can penetrate into a concrete because concrete is something like a, a porous material. Then we have to measure how, what is the uh, absorption? What is the permeability? What are the principles? So basically, uh, this was actually, uh, have, we have published a paper together with Professor Nanakar on the studies of that transport mechanism inside the concrete, how a material can transport inside the concrete. So here, what we have identified was not only us, but most of the researchers also did the same, also found the same uh, finding. The most deterioration problems of bridges and other structures were happen basically due to the continuous wetting and drying process. Like our country, we are in an uh, in area of uh, having a, like, a, we everybody's we having about six months of rain, six months of dry, it intermediate raining, so it's like a, somewhat like a wetting and drying process. So those areas, or partially submerged areas, usually having their primary transport mechanism is the absorption. So it's happening due to the capillary suction forces. So if I want to measure, or if we want to measure the issue or predicting issue for the durability 
for a particular concrete element, the main thing is that we have to measure the ability of absorption because the main durability issue will come with the transport mechanism of the primary transport mechanism of absorption. Since it is the primary mechanism, if I want to ensure that my structure will withstand for 100 years or so-called requirement, we have to identify what is the resistance of the particular concrete element is de delivering against the absorption. This is the first phase, the second. So permeation with the pressure gradient is usually it's coming with the water or air permeability. It's not actually the predominant transport mechanism, but I mean, for normal structures, it is not the case. For normal structures, the main issue is coming with the absorption. But if any kind of element, any kind of concrete, which is uh, constructed as a fully submerged concrete, or a concrete which is like a retain or resist or ingress in water like a dam or like a offshore oil platform or like retaining structures, water retaining structures, such kind of a mechanisms usually dealing with the water pressure. So for particular structures, if I want to assure, if I want to measure their durability resistance toward the uh, foreign particle ingression or reaction kinetics, I have to study, we have to study about their main issue, which could lead due to the permeability. So I think it's clear now, if I want to measure the durability kinetics or durability parameters for a normal structure, the main thing is to assure the absorption. If we want to ensure a submerged or fully submerged or a retaining structures like a water retaining structures, we have to assure that has a sufficient resistance toward the permeability. So next stage, the ionic diffusion, like chloride, carbon dioxide, such kind of things, we have identified or we can see a lot of tests were developed all over, the, all over the world to identify the diffusion. But the most research were proven that the diffusion is not a big case because diffusion also dealing with the absorption. Before starting the diffusion, it has to be absorbed into the porous media. Therefore, rather than analyzing on the diffusion mechanism, it's much easier and much uh, accurate to have, to identify the absorption properties or the capillary suction of the particular concrete element rather than wasting time on the identifying the ionic diffusion. So those are the three key things that we want to focus when we are dealing with the measurement techniques of durability. So those are the key durability tests usually using in Sri Lanka and other countries as well. There are a lot, but I have two, only few. Uh, for, to measure the abs abs absorption, there are standards called test method for density, absorption, and weight in hardened concrete. Usually measure, uh, it takes a sample of concrete and they are measuring or the, or the person he has to measure, what is the density of the particular concrete structure and what are the absorption and how much of weights in there in, the, in that hardened concrete. And another one is that sorptivity test. It's also some sort of a test. And there are another test called initial surface absorption, absorption test. So those are the tests we can categorize as the absorption measuring techniques. And there are another techniques that we can utilize to, issue, to, to measure the permeability or the penetratability. Here, basically, uh, the, the most of the popular test is the ASTMC 1202 or rapid chloride permeability test, usually use RCPT. Actually, in our test also, we have identified not only us, all over the world, most of the researchers were identified that this is actually not a permeability test. It's usually, actually it's measuring the resistivity of the saturated sample, but it's not the proper mechanism to identify the durability. Even though we are utilizing it, it's not the correct test. Since, because uh, we have published actually and further studies also are doing at University of Morito by engineering uh, Isuri with the supervision of Professor Nana Ankara, what we have identified was that 
since this test is not conducting at the steady state, it's just a six hour test with a very high voltage of 60 volt. That can cause variation in the temperature by changing the driving parameters of the test results. And it could mislead the presence of uh, fly ash or slag due to the dependency on the minor chemicals such as calcium. So that could get an idea about the OPC, yes, by utilizing this. But if we utilize in fly ash or slag, it will not deliver the real picture in terms of the durability by utilizing this test. So, and uh, AC impedance test was investigated in USA because they also identified that the test method is not good, it's not correct, it's not accurate. So they are also in the in the work process to develop alternative test methods instead of using RCPT. Now they are working on the proposed modification for the test. And another one, there are some tests called water permeability test, which calculate the permeability coefficient with Darcy's law. This is also a good test in terms of the permeability. And there are other porosity tests also utilizing helium and mercury por porosimetry. And some relay test also coming with boils, low for isothermic gas expansion. Yeah, they are utilizing these, these theorems to express the permeability of concrete. Uh, and it, it required higher pressure and oven dried sample that could cause for a, some kind of a significant variation. It reduces the accuracy or the repeatability of test. And then there are another test methods called gas permeability test, basically coming with nitrogen, oxygen, and other with the specific apparatus. It's very quicker test. But the main issue is coming with that if any kind of a moistures are inside those capillaries of that particular concrete element, then those will act like a barrier to the gases. So then again, it will be an issue for the accuracy of the test. And there are another diffusion based test method as well like node test method in NT build 443, it measures the chloride diffusion, but it's, it takes more time. So those are the key things that I want to emphasize to you that there are a lot of tests uh, available all over the world. Even our country, we are utilizing a lot of tests, but before utilizing any kind of test, we have to assure that we have to get, before we have to identify, we have to see, what are the possible root causes for my structure could lead to failure due to the concrete degradation? If it is because of the absorption process, then the better to utilize the absorption-based durability method. If it's basically coming with the, uh, it's like a dam or water retaining structure, better to go for a water permeability test. Those are more accurate when we compare with other test methods. Or if it is basically dealing with uh, submerged met submerged structure with uh, in a marine environment, better to go for both absorption and permeability tests. Okay, so this is a case study we have recently completed related to the RCPT. We took uh, samples from fly ash from our local uh, with the say and the Indian fly ash, and we have grounded them to get the much more similar fineness and identified, test, and produced the same kind of concrete mix design, which was class C40, grade 40 concrete, and studied the RCPD at the age of 56 days. And local fly ash, they have delivered less than 700 coulombs. I will explain that, what is the meaning of that. So usually in the RCPD test, we have to take a sample, which is having 100 millimeter of diameter with 50 millimeter of thickness. It is like a slice, slice of a small cylinder. Then we are applying 60 volt for six hours period by putting one edge we have to put into the sodium chloride and another edge we have to put into the sodium hydroxide. Then we have to keep for a six hours period to identify what is the total charge passed through the particular concrete element or particular concrete sample. Then, they have correlation, I mean, the, the coulombs means the number of charges passed. We know Q equals IT, it means Q, number of charges equals, I mean, the ampere into time, T in seconds. 
finally we can get the coulombs so here with that in the rcpd test they have categorized if the number of coulombs which was passed through that particular concrete element which is in between 100 to 1000 they call it a very low permeable concrete in some in terms of the chloride ion and if it is go beyond 1000 to 2000 level it called like a low permeable in terms of the chloride so what we did was we did the same kind of concrete with different fly ashes and identified or tested their coulomb values the local fly ash delivered 700 coulombs pretty good according to this categorization the indian fly ash is delivered more than 1500 coulombs which is uh, not good so, but when we take the strength the indian fly has delivered more strength in terms of the which was about four megapascal higher compressive strength compared to the local so you can see here basically like uh, i will come to that as well we'll discuss how the mechanism is coming before that i will uh, i will show you that there is a one this is actually xrf x-ray x-ray fluorescence mechanism to identify the chemical composition of both uh, fly ashes so silicon dioxide, you can see in the local fly ash, they're having about 54.37 and Indian, they have 6.82. Yes, this is, this is a, yes, I know that we can't directly say that uh, this is because of that uh, silicon dioxide because silicon also, they have different phases like amorphous and crystalline. For the particular reaction, actually we need more silica, silicon having amorphous phase. So here I have not categorized what is the amount of amorphous phase and what is the amount of crystalline phase. Okay, we'll assume that Indian fly ash have more amorphous phases of silicon dioxide. That could be the reason to increase up their strength. And then we have conducted the same test, I mean the same samples, same kind of samples to identify their permeability in terms of the water absorption. And it was identified that Indian fly ash has delivered better results than the sample fly ash number one. So then it seems like more contradictory. One, so one test method is delivering that uh, one is good, another is not good. I mean, comparatively, another test method saying that the, the vice versa. Okay, so the we have I didn't then we we wanted to see the real reason, what could be the reason, and it was found out. It happened because of the change in their four solutions with the changes in the fly ash chemical composition. So that is why the RCPD can be categorized as a, uh, it's nice to have test, but it is not delivering the actual results for durability aspects. The further studies are going on. Okay, then before jumping to the, actually I have not started yet the durability factors. We are coming to the topic step by step. We have already completed the identification of the topic. Then we have uh, got the, some sort of idea about how we can measure the durability and what are the terminology behind that. What is the transport mechanism that could lead to, do, to failures in the durability? Now we'll discuss on the hydration mechanism, the conventional cement and other cement that is material. That will help us to get an idea in terms of the uh, concrete mix designing and identification and get an idea about the concrete works. Okay, cement. Usually, the main ingredient is Portland clinker, which is an artificial mineral. Basically, it's forming with uh, calcium carbonate with other materials. So we'll discuss. Here you can see the cement chemistry is a bit of different. Here we are utilizing C, not for carbon, but for calcium oxide. S not for sulfur, but for silicon dioxide. A for aluminum oxide. F not for chloride, but for ferric oxide. Okay. So here, uh, those are micro, microscopic image. You can see here different colors like blue, sorry, brown, blue, ash, likewise. But actually, the clinker particles are not like this kind of a very beautiful. This was actually a it was colored with the hydrochloric acid to get more clear, uh, to get more visibility, to identify different phases easily. That's how it is delivering different colors. So here, 
you can see C3S. C3S means there are three atoms of or three molecules of calcium oxide coming together with one atom of or one molecule of silicon dioxide. C4AF means there are four molecules of calcium oxide with one aluminum oxide with the one ferric oxide. C2S means there are two calcium oxide molecules with the one silicon dioxide molecule. And C3A means there are three calcium oxide molecules coming with the one aluminum oxide molecule. Okay, so now we know to produce clinker, to produce cement, we need calcium, we need silicon, we need oxygen, we need aluminum, and we need ferric. So now we can identify, we can think what are the raw materials which we need to produce cement. Yes, we need limestone, which is coming with calcium carbonate and uh, silicon dioxide, basically. Then we have to put some other correctives to get the optimum amount of aluminum and ferric to produce cement. If you, if you, if you can recall the memory during your school books, it was mentioned as it's coming with calcium carbonate and clay we have to put to produce uh, cement. It's, it's different in different countries. In our country, in Putlam, or only Putlam is producing cement currently belongs to NC. So, uh, in microscopically, the clinker, they're having, uh, it's like a gray colored or white color as well. For specific applications, they have a white cement. It's like a rocky material. The grain size could be less than 50 millimeters. Okay, now we know about the, the C3S, we know about C2S, we have an idea about C3A, C4F, SO3, we'll come to later. Okay, C3S in cement chemistry called a light. It delivering the early strength and increase heat of hydration. And b light, C2S means b light, it delivering late strength and aluminate, it deliver some sort of a small amount of early strength, but it is acting as a initiate of the hydration process and it deliver more heat of hydration. Ferrite, which is having a more effect on the color and very later stage, a very recent studies were found out, it is having an indirect impact on the durability as well because of some process engineering parameters are dealing with the, uh, with the, uh, the clinker formation inside the kiln. It's, I will not discuss it here. Yes, there are some impacts coming on the durability as well. And the sulfate, for that one, uh, the C3A, it's a very reactive material. If I take cement powder without putting a gypsum, just by grinding this clinker and putting to a water, then it will create a very, it will have a sudden uh, setting. It means we can't have, we will not have a sufficient amount of time to work. The workability will be very less due to the some reaction kinetics which is coming daily basically with the C3A. It's a very aggressive uh, chemical. So to reduce the impact or the, or the reaction rate of C3A, we have in cement industry, we are utilizing sulfate. Basically, the sulfate could be coming from natural gypsum or could be some artificial gypsum or other anhydride or such kind of material. But the requirement is to get the sulfate, SO3 which is directly impacting on the setting behavior, the workability and the other controlling of the heat of hydration and those aspects. Okay, so now we have a rough idea on the cement chemistry and we'll, we'll see the reaction phases when we put, uh, when we use cement, when we mix it with water, what are the reaction could be happen and what is the time being that could be happen or eventually what would happen with the time being. So in the initial stage, C3A will react with gypsum, means SO3, and it will form a tringite. Just focus on that, a tringite. It's, a, it's basically a basic material that could, that is always generating in a concrete. The tringites are helping to control the workability of the particular concrete. A tringite, it's a normal product, which is having a bit of a, uh, higher or lower density when compared with the other, uh, the main product which is coming from this, the, the C3S or C2S hydration. So as we discussed previously, C3S and C2S are the main key components that is delivering early and late strengths. So 
with the the reaction of C3S with water means H they form CSH gel. We call it like a since it's like a gel, it's actually not like a very soft gel, but it's like a gel forming material. We call it CSH plus OH minus. It means usually called calcium hydroxide, which is called Portlandite. The same reaction happened with the C2S as well. With the C4AF, usually produce much similar reaction as C3A with gypsum. It's also happening in like a monosulfate. So those are the, initially within few seconds, minutes, the reaction will happen and it will take a few hours to start that C3S reaction and few days to start the C2S and other reactions. Okay, so this is the one research I have to take, found from my research papers to uh, the hydration versus concrete composition. In fresh concrete, to produce concrete, we are using, utilizing cement, water, and there are some aggregates. Aggregates means sand and metal. Because I have a And there will be some air as well. Since we can't eliminate those air, there will be some air forces as well. And when it becoming hardened concrete, there will be aggregates, porous, porosity will be there, and cement hydrates with the water filled porous structure that will be there. This is the final composition of a concrete, hardened concrete. And uh, in different aspects, we are utilizing water cement ratios. Water cement ratios means the amount of water that we are putting to produce the particular concrete, it's a weight or mass based ratio. Usually in concrete, it's lying with about 0.6 to 0.3 ratio. Between that, it's a typical range. And uh, during cement hydration, it's usually based on the depend on, depending on the water cement ratios, the portion of added water will be chemically converted into the hydrates, as we, as we discussed previously, CSH gel. And those hydrated cement paste is like the glue, or it's acting like the bonding element of the concrete. It means all the sands, aggregates, it will take it will take hold and make it like a glue to produce a one mixer of concrete. So cement paste will act as a glue of the concrete. Okay, so when we come to the hydration kinetics, you can see as we discussed previously, this is C3S. You can see C3A within this is hydration time in hours. This is in the logarithmic scale. You can see within very short a period, C3A will come to the picture. And then C4F also will come, C3S and C2S. This is the hydration mechanism. So we can link the similar with the heat of hydration as well. Since those are exothermic reactions, those are delivering more heat to the atmosphere. So we can identify how much of heat could generate by changing the chemical composition of particular cement. If I want to reduce the heat of hydration, I have to reduce C3A and C3S. Similarly, if I want to increase the heat of hydration for like a whole country or whatever, for a purpose, I have to increase C3A or C3S. So those are the basic chemical compositions or chemical engineering or whatever we can utilize to change our application behaviors at the face of civil or end user site. Here I have utilized some sort of a results taken from helium porosity meter and the water uh, saturation porosity with the water cement ratios. You can see the red line which is after two years and uh, the black line is after 90 years. You can see it's reducing. The porosity is getting reduced with the time. It's basically because these reactions could be happen for a longer period and with the time being, the porosity will be reduced. So that is the mechanism. That is the reason that uh, with the time being, the porosity and the porosity of the, of the particular concrete will reduce. Okay, so the heat of hydration, if we discuss initially, there are stages in the mixing stage, workable stage, and the setting stage and early strength formation stage. 
So this is much important when we are doing a mass concrete, like a big concrete structure, which we don't want to evaluate or we don't want to, uh, to, to generate more heat because it's, it's, it's having a more tendency to, to generate a hot tub uh, concrete. We don't want to do that because of some kind of a, uh, negative features. So such kind of a things, if you want to reduce the heat evolution of a concrete, we have to dealing with the chemical composition and other parameters we'll discuss in later stages. So we have already discussed about the, about the chemical composition of cement and how it's getting react. Now you can see the microscopical images which you have taken from the University of Moratua uh, for concrete. This is a one, this is CSHL at magnification level of 150, 1500 and 5000. So you can see some porous structures here, some porosities here as well. We can see clearly some porous structures. This is the CSHL. Ultimately, we can get by uh, reacting cement with water. Okay, this is basically a 2D structure, which is not much stable in acid, uh, which is amorphous. Because of that, it's very hard to detect with the XRD techniques. We can we have to utilize other techniques to identify the CSH formation, like FTIR, NMR, likewise. And the presence of chemical bounded H2O, since this CSH gel is formed with calcium, silicon, and H2O, it's having a vulnerability at a higher temperature because, likewise, more than 450 degrees, it is, it is having a tendency to deform or decompose those CSA gel back to the H2O. So you can see here, there are a lot of uh, cavities or porous structure, porosities there. Suppose that if any kind of a material or water can accumulate inside the porous media at high temperature, like 450 degrees, then there will be a very high pressure moisture could be generated or very high pressure vapor could be generated inside those pore structures. That could lead to a failure of concrete. That is the reason that conventional concretes are not much stable at higher temperatures. The reason is that it was formed with CSA gel. It means if we want to make a concrete which is having a more robustness against a high temperature, then we have to change that particular structure of micro, structure of the particular formation from CSH to another level. There are a lot of research are going on. Actually, I am also engaging with the one research to change the, the chemical or microscopical level of a concrete. So those are the things that we have to deal with the, when we are working with concretes. There are pros and there are cons. If you want to make those, if you want to change or if you want to eliminate those cons or negative sides, we have to identify what is the real root cause behind that cons or a negative matter. And then we have to identify the possible scenarios or possible options to overcome such kind of a negative matters. Okay. Then we'll come to the to some sort of uh, uh, mineralogical matters or minerals, how latent hydraulic like slag or porcelanic material like fly ash or porcelana are acting. Basically, I will take uh, in, in as we discussed previously, if we put OPC with water, we can get, as we discussed previously, calcium silicate hydrate gel, which is provide the higher the required strength with calcium hydroxide or Portlandite. There are pros and cons of this Portlandite. The positive is it provides the required alkalinity because calcium hydroxide is an alkaline material. It provides the required alkalinity to the hardened concrete creating the, to create the passivation layer, which is a good side. The negative side is that calcium hydroxide having a good water solubility. So in case of the moisture ingression to, into the concrete structures, those calcium hydroxide have a tendency to leach due to its high water solubility, creating some 
a porous structure or increase in the porosity inside the concrete. So it's there are good and positive and negative both. Okay, if I blend with those OPC with uh, slag or a fly ash or porcelain map, those with the slag usually it will not react actually with the calcium hydroxide. Slag itself, it's having some kind of a chemical composition which is much similar to the clink, but it's it's very lazy, it doesn't have much reactivity. It has to be alkaline, uh, a media to get the required reactivity. We, we usually we call it alkaline activation. So likewise, the fly ash, with the fly ash, fly ash means it's a aluminosilicate material. Fly ash having aluminates and silicates. So by improving the alkalinity of that uh, particular mixture, we can dissolve those aluminum silicates to get the required calciums and aluminates into the solution. And after that, those can be react with the calcium hydroxide by to form much similar product, which is like a calcium silicate hydrate gel, which provides additional strength. And similarly, that could reduce the uh, existed uh, porosity, which is good. Okay, so here in results by utilizing uh, those kind of materials, end result is those are reduced the vulnerability on the acidic sulfate chloride attacks because it's creating a denser concrete with additional strength development over the time period. This is a positive side. And it reduces concrete shrinkages due to the control heat of hydration because usually in the concrete industry, they use slag, fly ash as a supplementary cementitious material. They can reduce the amount of cement because uh, slag or fly ash also delivering the additional strength. So they doesn't want to deliver additional strength in order to deliver additional strength, what they are doing they maintain the same strength level by reducing the amount of cement addition to the concrete. So because of that, the cement is delivering more C3S and C3A, which are the, the main root causes for heat of hydration. By reducing those materials, they can reduce the heat generation and it is good for some other, the string cages and heat of hydration matters. And it improve workability and it, because ultimately to improve the strength at low resources cost, durability with it's better and it's green and sustainable because the slag and fly ashes are byproducts from other industrial products, industries like electrical industry or power generation industry and other steel industry. But because of the reduction of calcium hydroxide, those are vulnerable to attacks due to the carbonation. We'll discuss it. At the, at the carbonation section, okay? In the limestone. Limestone also, uh, I have took this from this uh, research. And uh, here you can see the, the change of porosity and the compressive strength as a percentage. The zero means conventional OPC. And here, the addition of amount of calcium carbonate addition, limestone addition, you can see, up to about 2% uh, of addition of limestone, even it improve the strength, even up to 10%. And it reduces porosity. Reduction of porosity means it's a plus sign for improvement of durability. So it's good to improve the durability. But in terms of the durability, when it comes to the level of 8%, addition of 8%, afterward, the porosity will increase. It means it reduces the durability. When it comes to the strength, even up to the 12% level, it, will, it is comparable to the, uh, with, the, with respect to the OPC. So in terms of the durability, 8% addition will be comparable, comparable with OPC. In terms of the strength, it's still it's comparable about 12%. So it is not recommended to use in the addition of, in the conditions of like severe conditions like sulfate exposures. And it was identified as a catalytic effect for DEF formation in concrete. So those are the key things which you have to focus when we are utilizing supplementary cementitious material. 
they are a pros and they are a cons. Always we have to utilize them based on our exposure classes and our applications requirement. Okay, now we have already discussed about the, uh, the what is the durability and how we can measure the durability and uh, uh, what are the, the factors that we have to consider during the, uh, the cement hydration process. Now we will discuss about the modes of deterioration's and what are the significance of them, how we can measure them, and what are the things which we can do to avoid those durability issues. Okay, so the first one is the chlorination. As we discussed previously, chlorination started with the, the initially the chloride molecule has to come to the uh, to the, top, the surface of the concrete. Then it, it's like ad adsorption, it will adsorb, and then with the moisture particles and uh, with their pore structures, it will, it will absorb with the capillary pressure to the concrete. And after a certain level, it will diffuse, but we can't say whether it's diffuse or it, it will finish the absorption and it will uh, get to a stagnated level which is with, with the uh, saturation level of the concentration. But this is the, the predictable way the stages of the process. How, suppose that you are the chloride atom and you came, just imagine that you are an atom of a chloride and you came to the surface of a concrete due to a sea breeze or whatever thing and you adhere, ad, 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 adhere to the surface of the concrete and due to the capillary suction with the presence of moisture, you penetrated into the concrete which, with their very, very tiny, canals we call pore, pore structures or uh, some capillary pores you are penetrated into there and your friends also come in following you and there will be a lot of chloride atoms by by enhancing this chloride number of chloride atoms the concentration of the chloride will be higher and then the ph will be go down and there will be other reactions we call it the chloride reaction with the with the iron which is a electron exchanging reaction. The ultimate result is the, is the corrosion of the steel and corrosion, the product of corros corrosion. I mean the calcium, usually we utilize iron or steel inside the, in the, inside the concrete as reinforcements. The product of the corrosiveness of the corrosive products of those ions, uh, corroded products, those are like ferric oxide basically, which is an expansive product. So in, uh, if something happened inside the uh, very solid state uh, or solid material, likewise that uh, if I take a water glass bottle and fill with water and put into the refrigerator, the same thing will happen here because with the freezing process, ice, the density of ice is less than the uh, density of water. Because of that, it, it, it required more space, more volume. Ultimate results is the cracking of the water bottle. The same thing will happen here by cracking the concrete. The cracking means there will be a more openings, the more chloride ions can penetrate, and then the, there will be a severe corrosion, penetration, corrosion process will be inside the concrete. It's like a vicious circle. Okay. There are a lot of mechanisms I have developed. I have took a one which was developed basically with the fixed second law of transport phenomena. Very familiar equation for chemical engineers, I suppose. You can see here the main the things. The Cx means the, the, the chloride content at the x because the thing is that uh, to initiate the corrosion of steel, it has to be uh, come to the critical limit of chloride concentration. So here, utilizing the, this equation, we can identify how much of time will take to reach that uh, saturated level, the Cx. So the basically, the, you can see here, the concentration at the concrete surface, depth from the surface of the structure, and the diffusion coefficient of chlorides and time. Those are the key governing factors to identify the, the required time, how much of time will take to reach the critical limit 
which can leads to a corrosion of steel. So if I want to increase the time, or if I want to increase the service life of the particular structure, what I want to, to do is that I have to increase the depth from the surface of the structure, which means the covering thickness. And the diffusion coefficient of chloride has to be reduced. It means I have to make my concrete less porous. So, and another one is that if I can reduce the chloride concentration at the concrete surface, that also uh, next good thing, like applying a coating, which can reduce the permeability of the concrete, uh, like a reduction of water penetration by, by, by applying some nano film or different techniques. With those kind of techniques, we can reduce, we can address to the basic governing factors for chloride penetration or chloride induced corrosion. So addressing to, to the porosity and the covering thickness are the more crucial factors in against the chloride diffusion, or we can change the addition by applying some sort of a non-permeable coating on top of the concrete layer, like a paint or different kind of aspects. So utilization of fly ash or slag with the low water cement ratio with proper curing, we can improve the durability performance against the chloride ingestion. Okay, so we have discussed about the, the theory behind the chloride attack. Now we know how a chloride ion can penetrate, what are the governing factors, and how we can control those root causes by addressing to those governing factors. So this is what we call engineering. First, we have to identify the challenge or problem, then we can define the problem, then we can identify the root causes for the problem. By identifying root causes, we easily we can eliminate those causes to eliminate the problem. This is the way we are practicing engineering. Okay, so this is also one research we have completed uh, and published already. You can see the improvements. Here we have utilized different combination OPC, uh, OPC plus fly, uh, limestone 15%, uh, OPC plus 30% uh, fly ash, OPC plus 15% plus fly ash, OPC plus ground granulated plus slag 35%. And identified with different durability indicators. We have utilized here uh, 56 days initial surface absorption, 56 days water penetration, 56 days uh, water absorption. Identify how much of uh, durability in terms of the durability we can improve in the water cube. Here you can see the, 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 the improvement as a percentage. This was generated with a concrete sample, we have initially prepared a concrete sample and it was placed uh, inside the pure water for seven days for the requirement of water curing. And same kind of a sample was kept at ambient condition without doing any kind of a water curing. Then we have tested both samples uh, following these uh, test methods. And then we have recorded what is the value given for the ambient cured sample and what was the value delivered for the water cured sample. Then we have developed what was the difference or improvements of the durability between ambient cured sample and the water cured sample. So you can see here, even after, if I take the, the water absorption results, in the amber color, you can see even up to 40%, we can achieve with the, with the different with the utilization of water curing, proper water curing. And the strength gain also did the same kind of a way. Only difference is that here we have tested for durability parameters. Here we have tested, tested for a strength gain. So you can see here, uh, OPC doesn't show a significant impact on the strength uh, development with the curing because OPC usually having a tendency to complete its hydration very quickly with the chemical compositions, but uh, rest of the other material, they having other mineral compound, it takes time. So therefore you can see, if you are utilizing OPC, uh, the strength gaining will not much impact on the, on the, on the, with the water curing, but for the OPC as well, you can clearly see the durability will improve drastically. So 
for whatever cement types, water curing or proper curing and reduction of water cement ratios are very important if we want to get higher strength and higher durability. In terms of the material utilization, also it's very sustainable because we can get the required strength and durability with the less amount of material if we can deliver more strength with the same amount of material. Easily we can cut down the amount that we are putting. So uh, we have completed the chlorination. Now we are coming, now we are coming to the carbonation. I will, since we have already discussed about the theories, I will quickly go through the presentation. So carbonation is also much similar. The carbon dioxide will come with the, uh, with the absorption process. Then it will gradually will come to the level of uh, reinforcement. Since we all know that the carbonation, calcium uh, carbon dioxide, it reduces the uh, it's hit to the passivation layer, which protect that uh, uh, protect that uh, reinforcement. And with that reactions, the reinforcement can be corroded. So for that one, the it's the mechanism is something bit different than the previous. It's also delivered with the modified fixed second law with the transport phenomena. Here you can see the main, the main parameters are coming with the covering thickness as we discussed previously because the, 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 the distance that carbon dioxide has to travel with the time is, is, a, is a crucial factor. And this type of cement, which type of cement we are utilizing. So those are the governing factor to reduce the carbonation. Here you can see I have taken this uh, from this uh, relay research. You can see uh, they are utilizing fly ash, silica fume, limestone, slag, and OPC. You can see in fly ash and silica fume they are having about 2.3 times higher carbonation possibility rather than OPC. And for limestone having about 1.9 times higher carbonation possibility than OPC and slag having about 1.3 times higher possibility of carbonation than OPC. So previously we discussed about chlorination. For that matter, the fly ash and slag was the best, but for the carbonation matter, OPC is the best. So there are no any kind of a cement material we can use as a universal, the best, there are no such kind of a cement product. We have to select them based on our application and their expertise to which stand for a particular or respective exposure condition. So here, so something I want to discuss here. So here you can see the, the, the resource was taken after two years period. The upper is showing that uh, how much of depth of the concentration of carbon dioxide with the depth of depth from the surface of the concrete. You can see this is a wet and dry cycle applied concrete with similar, very similar to our country's condition. This is, they didn't apply wet and dry cycle. It's just put into a dry condition. You can see initially in the wet and dry cycle, OPC delivering better results compared with higher amount of fly ash. The reason is that fly ash consume more uh, Portlandite or calcium hydroxide, which was came from the cement hydration process. But OPC has more calcium hydroxide, which was not consumed by other minerals. So they can react with carbon dioxide to neutralize or to form calcium carbonate inside the concrete. That is the reason. So uh, by applying those theories, we have did uh, research or actually uh, one good work uh, with NBRO. I think uh, engineer Tushari also here. Uh, we did uh, together with the Professor Nanakar's guidance. So I, we, our task, we actually, we wanted to assess the age of a concrete sample. Here we have utilized two methods. Uh, press method, we have utilized the Japanese construction ministry's publications. They have a method one, uh, which is coming with these equations. And we utilize another method, which was basically derived with chemical engineering uh, or transport phenomena principles. To identify with the Nernst Einstein equation on diffusivity, we have somehow we have uh, with the, with some effective assumptions and things we have calculated uh, those results. Actually, the 
the, the in, we have utilized the INSEE laboratories to do this uh, test. And uh, ultimately, we were able to, to calculate the bulk electrical conductivity, and we have found out the, the age of the particular concrete samples. Actually, this was a court case, and ultimately, we were uh, uh, solved that faithfully. I hope so. So, uh, the acidic attacks. Now we have already covered carbonation, chlorination. This is now the remaining parts is small. Acidic attacks. So based on the Portland Cement Association's definitions, if a pH value of acid or pH value of a soil, if it is go less than 6.5, they have categorized it as acid, acidic exposure condition. So usually, no any kind of hydraulic cement concrete. Hydraulic cement means the conventional cement or fly ash or slab, which deliver hydraulic reactions. They don't have such kind of a hydraulic cement concrete which can withstand a pH value less than three or lower. So these are I have taken from the same uh, research paper. You can see with the, with the depth of the concrete, which is actually piled, uh, you can see how deteriorating the concrete. The paste of the concrete or the cement are getting dissolved inside of acid, acid, only the aggregates are uh, in the surface. So I have took one research findings which uh, was done by University of Colombo to identify the, the acidity level of Colombo and suburban areas. You can see here the pH value even 2.5 are present in the areas of but the dear to Vienna, and this, this uh, closest area close to Corte and uh, in the suburban areas. So, if we can't produce a concrete where that could withstand uh, less than three, then you can see the, the critical situation that we have to face. If we are delivering a concrete, or if, or if we are doing uh, some structural work at that kind of pH level, first we have to identify the, the soil conditions. What are the pH values inside the con inside the, the soil? And based on that, we have to de develop better solutions to overcome durability challenges. Otherwise, the concrete that will uh, degrade within a very short period rather than we are expecting uh, to get the full of service life. Here we are delivering, developing some, some research, actually research and developments are going on. Those are related, related with my PhD studies. So we are delivering some we identify the possibilities to develop more robust products uh, to withstand against acidic conditions. So you, you can see here, this is 100% OPC. Uh, this is 70% uh, OPC with 30% fly ash, 40% OPC with 60% fly ash. You can see still the, 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 the addition of fly ashes are delivering better results with with comparatively OPC, but still they also have some decay. So here you can see how the, the conventional concrete are working in uh, under condition of uh, acidic HCl, especially we have less HCl for accelerated conditions test. You can see how the new product, those are geopolymers actually, uh, we have developed. You can see under the same condition how their performance is the conventional OPC and the geopolymers. You can see here how the OPC is behave. It's like a gel. It's, it became like paste at this accelerated condition, but still uh, those materials were managed to withstand against this issue. So those kind of techniques and improvements and research and developments need for our construction industry as well to overcome such kind of challenges. Now I will come to the mass concrete. DEF formation and thermal crack section. This is also uh, some sort of a multidisciplinary task, basically dealing with reaction kinetics and controlling of reaction kinetics, modeling, simulation, such kind of things. Uh, so in our country or not only our country, all over the world, uh, the mass concrete was not defined specifically. Uh, mass concrete means a concrete which is having a big 3D uh, dimensions. Usually in the general guidelines, if any kind of a wall which is having about 500 millimeter of thickness or slabs or file caps or rough foundation having more than 800,000 millimeter of least dimensions are taking as mass borings or mass concrete. 
and they are having conventionally they are having limits as 20 degrees for the temperature difference temperature difference means we already discussed about the about the about the reaction kinetics of cement so during the reaction kind reaction of cement or the hydration reaction there are a lot of heats getting generated so suppose that if we are producing a cake or we are producing some sort of a, like a dodo or whatever thing we know if i make a cake and put into the surface of a desk or on top of a desk and if i check for a certain after a certain period of time uh, the temperature of uh, of the surface will be lesser than the temperature at the core or at the middle because uh, at the middle it doesn't have a much uh, opportunity to eliminate or to 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 uh, dispose their heat of heat generated heat because of that it's getting accumulated and the the, the temperature getting rise so temperature difference means the temperature difference between the highest temperature position of the concrete and the lowest usually the middle and the surface in specification it says it has to be less than 20 degrees and the maximum temperature or usually the core temperature has to be less than 70 we'll discuss what is the engineering fundamental on these two conventional limits okay so before that we'll discuss about what is a tring guide we already know what is a tring guide initially with the reaction of concrete uh, csh form and we know c2s and c3s form csh and c3a with reaction of so3 will produce a tring guide we already discussed that matter but with the high high amount of heat or thermal forces this etringite is decomposing or deforming back to the gypsum and o3 and c3a it decompose back because it's not stable at higher temperatures at the presence of moisture this is very important at the presence of moisture it will react again because moisture will create the the the, the required the reaction media and again it will form the uh, etringite i already told you that etringite is a expansive product which is also much similar the expansion happening uh, during the freezing process of a water bottle like a glass water bottle the same thing happened here the concrete with the time being it's getting hardened the concrete already hardened but due to the ingestion of moisture now it's developing some expansive product inside the concrete with that pressure concrete can get damage it can create cracks so since it's happening at the delayed ages we call delayed etringite this is the that is the mechanism of etringite formation in delayed stages this is not good because of that we can there will be a non reversible cracks we can reverse it that reaction back to the normal situation only thing what we can have to do i already told there are two mechanisms two key things are involving with this reaction first one is the heat because of that heat this formed etringite getting decomposed back and presence of moisture it generated back the etringite so if we can eliminate this the easiest way is to eliminate this the heat generation this will not decompose and there will not have a risk on def formation and if there is an issue of high temperature then the best thing what we have to do is to eliminate the possibility of moisture ingestion it's a bit of a hard task we know always precautions is better than acting on later stages so we have to take the precautions to eliminate the risk on high heat generation okay so then we have to identify how the heat is generating with the cement so process engineers task is this basically we know with the cement content if we have to put more cement then it will generate more heat and the chemical composition if the cement is having more c3s or c3a then there will be a more amount of heat generation and if the chemical composition having more c3s or c3a 
with higher fineness. Higher fineness means the particle size of the cement is very low. It means it's having more surface area, which is very good for the reaction. It generate the heat very rapidly. So it basically dealing with the rate of heat generation. And then the size of the element, the big sizes are generating more heat. And if those are enclosed with steel or like uh, heat conductive material, then the heat can be dissipated easily. But if it is not, the heat will generate more. So if we can control those things, we can eliminate the risk on, uh, risk on heat of hydration. So here, those are the some uh, theories. I will not going to describe here much. So basically for the civil engineers understanding, when the temperature of a concrete is getting high at that stage, the concrete generating more, uh, more of compressive forces. So concrete can withstand against the compressive forces because they are very good in compressive uh, stages. But when the concrete getting to start their cooling phase, then it generated the reverse, the tensile forces. So, so concretes are not good against the tensile forces because of that there will be some cracks formation. We call it thermal cracks. So that is the, the, the engineering principle behind that crack formation. So if we can manage those the tensile forces, which could lead due to the heat, high, high amount of heat dissipation, we can eliminate the thermal cracks. That is why there is a, there is a limit for the maximum temperature because uh, the temperature gradient is the driving force. We know that uh, Q, the amount of heat uh, transport is, uh, is proportional to the, the temperature difference between two, two edges like, the, uh, like uh, the ampere or the current is proportional to the, the variance of uh, voltage, the similar thing. The temperature gradient is the driving force of that particular heat. If we can reduce that driving force, we can reduce the heat generation. For that one also, there are uh, theories behind that to identify how, the, uh, how we can control the, the, the concrete tracks generation. For that one, there are very good uh, identifications were generated to identify what is the best possible limit with the other respective things. So here basically, uh, for our country's case, there are a lot of research are going, and Professor Narakar with uh, with, this, uh, with the Professor Kondra Singh in University of Jawadhanpur, they are doing the research to formulate, uh, to identify different kind of uh, aggregates in our country to formulate the suitable limits for our country. And for the temperature, maximum temperature, there are guidelines. This is also a very good engineering principle as we discussed previously. The risk is very high when it exposed to the moisture. I told you that with the presence of moisture, the, Europe, the, 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 the delayed detringite formation is getting expedited. So if we can reduce that, the moisture ingression, we can reduce the delayed detringite formation as well. So here uh, with these standards, if we refer these standards, they have very systematically or rationally categorized how we can develop or how we can control those uh, temperature limits within the allowable area. So for that one, uh, there is a very good uh, mechanism has developed. Initially, we need to identify what is the requirement of project. Suppose that it, if it is a, a building having a very big uh, element, then the exposure condition will be different. If it is a, like a dam or such kind of a thing, it is having a very high risk on DEF formation because it's it's already always dealing with water that could lead to have a more moisture ingression or penetration throughout through that particular concrete element. So first we have to identify what is the project based requirement and their exposure classes. Then we can develop mixtures, concrete mixtures to get the required compressive strength. And then we can evaluate the heat of hydration with the uh, new ASTM codes as generated. Utilizing this, we can identify the heat of hydration, the generation of heat of hydration. And there are a lot of finite element modeling are there, like MIDAS, JCI, Japanese guidelines, ANSYS, et cetera, to model the, the concrete element with the support of uh, heat of hydration data. 
then we can identify if it is required to complete a mock-up, what is the suitable mix design. Otherwise, we have to do a lot of mix designs to identify the suitable concrete mix design, which can uh, develop the required compressive strength as well as the other uh, temperature parameters. So if we can do such kind of a modeling with the new engineering approach, we can do only, if required, only one mock-up to identify the uh, heat generation and other parameters. So this was developed, the method was developed, the, the usually the, the former uh, specification, they requested two, two different uh, mock-ups to identify core temperature and the surface temperatures in a two different manner. But uh, Professor Nanakar has developed that method. With single mock-up test, we can get the core details to identify what would be the possible highest temperature temperature at the, and with the highest temperature gradient. And uh, with different kind of uh, methods, we can redu reduce the risk on uh, heat of hydration. For that, we can utilize uh, different cementitious material to reduce heat generation. We can utilize pre-cooling. For that one, we can utilize more thermodynamics to identify the pre-cooling requirements and post-cooling requirements of the, of the concrete and other construction management like uh, placing at night because ambient temperature also impacting on the on the concrete temperature. So if we can place, if we can utilize the night time, the ambient temperature will get reduced and it's a positive thing. So those kind of uh, engineering principles or engineering approaches we can utilize to overcome those challenges. And those are the, some kind of a, uh, comparison between uh, cooling pipes or post-cooling and uh, pre-cooling with liquid nitrogen and insulation to control the uh, temperature gradients. Those are the comp comparison between advantages and disadvantages. So based on the, the construction requirements and the, based on the other financial aspects as well as the limits, we can utilize what is the best option for our project. And we'll come to the classic shrinkage cracking here. Uh, if this is very common all over the country, this is not uh, important, not only for civil engineers, but other everybody's as well. Usually we are doing uh, slabs during our house constructions. We have to, most of the people, they are doing slabs, concrete slabs. And if you are doing concrete slabs uh, in a very uh, windy or a very sunny day, it's having a more tendency to deliver such kind of a cracks. We call it flash six shrinkage cracks. So, uh, for that particular matter, there were a lot of uh, studies were done. Basically, Professor uh, Dr. Surya Chal Surya Chal Prahuna, he was done very good comprehensive analysis to identify the mechanism of, of this plastic swing gauge forming. And then uh, this is a, uh, one experimental setup to evaluate the potential of plastic swing gauge tracking with different environmental condition. And uh, he has developed, you can see, this is a normal concrete. Actually, this video is short, the total, the length of the video is uh, three hours length, but it was shortened. It was fast forward. Good. You can see how the reaction initially, they have a water layer and it was evaporated. And then now the surface is very dried. With the time you will be able to see some crack formation in the surface of this concrete, so which is much similar that a uh, lot of ladies, they are utilizing moisturizing cream to protect their sun, which is much similar for concrete as well. If the evaporation is higher than the bleeding, then there will be a risk on uh, this kind of a crack formation. We call it classic shrinkage cracking. Then uh, it was delivered such kind of a, uh, the pressure monitoring were done to identify uh, how the pressures are getting changed, what are the capillary pauses are involving uh, with that process as previously I have shown during the video. Uh, with the changing of the bleeding and the operation, it was identified that the capillary pauses are generating more negative pressures. It generates some suction with the formation of these hemiscus. Uh, there will be some surface tension. So with the surface tension, there will be a tendency, to of tendency towards the crack formation on the surface of concrete. So the smaller the four sizes, there will be a more negative pressure and the risk on the, on the shrinkage cracking will be higher because of the 
higher negative capillary pressure. So if we can change the capillary pressure, yes, then we can avoid the plastic shrinkage cracking. The, this, this equation, the model was developed in ACI, American Concrete Institute. And their model was that they, they told that if any condition, they have developed this E, it means the evaporation rate index, TC means concrete temperature, R means relative humidity, TA means ambient temperature, V means wind velocity. They are, they, those are the four key factors that are governing the, 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 uh, the plastic shrinkage cracking. So here they told that, the American Concrete Institute, they told that if the concrete for a particular situation, whatever, if, suppose that if I want to make a concrete now, so I can measure what is the concrete temperature, what is the air temperature, what is the humidity condition, what is the wind velocity of a particular area and for my concrete. With that, I can predict what is the evaporation rate index with this equation. And ACI was suggested that if it is go beyond one, then there will be a risk on, uh, risk on uh, plastic shrinkage cracking. But for, for the context of Sri Lanka, Dr. Suraj was identified. It's also basically change with the cement type. But basically, if it is go beyond 0.5 level, then there will be a risk on uh, high risk on uh, crack formation. So if I want to reduce, if we want to reduce the plastic shrinkage crack for our particular case, we can take measurements to reduce air temperature. How we can reduce the air temperature? We can do the concreting at night. For the surface temperature of the concrete temperature, we can use utilize uh, some chill water or ice to make the concrete. It, it will help to reduce the concrete temperature and we can utilize wind barriers, putting some polythene barriers or whatever thing to reduce the wind velocity. Such kind of things we can utilize to eliminate the risk on plastic shrinkage cracking. That is the importance what I want to emphasize you by knowing the real theory behind any kind of engineering aspect, the real road cause, it's very much easier for us to uh, address those things to mitigate reputations or such kind of a negative impact. So I will take this one. Uh, previously I showed that Chinta Madam was here. Uh, this is her subject actually. I, I take some research papers from her, her uh, from University of Pera, the Nichinda Madam, uh, Dr. Zinta Patrigan. So I have taken some, some literatures from hers as well. I will show. So basically, ASR, alkali silica reactions. Uh, so there are some suspective cases for Victoria Dam. Uh, they have identified some structural displacement. It is coming, and one online monitoring was are doing by University of Pera. So we'll see what is, what is the ASR. So ASR means, as we discussed previously, we have to utilize aggregates, metal, and concrete done. So such, such wise, the coarse aggregates are there. Sometimes they might have reactive, reactive silicon. And with the cement, there will be a hydroxyl ions, sodium ions, some cations like calcium plus potassium, sodium, likewise cations. And uh, with these reactive silicates, they can have a reaction between those cations and they will form some secondary uh, calcium silicate hydrate. And with that, the aggregates also can formulate with this reactions forming gel. It's like ASR, we call it ASR gel inside this ag aggregate. And that also form such this kind of a cracks, which is much similar to the crack that we can see with the DEF formation. And some research to identify that elevated temperature or high temperature during the mass pouring also act as a catalyst for this ASR reaction. So those are the three essential requirements for ASR formation. They should have a reactive silica with aggregates. They should have a sufficient moisture, sufficient moisture, ingression, to, to fulfill the required reaction media and sufficient amount of alkali. So this I have taken from, this is actually not suspect case, this is a proven case. ASR at Senanaika Samudre, Manraja. Uh, the studies are doing with the irrigation department, we are also engaging Professor Nanayakara supervision. So here I have took this picture, I have took this picture during my personal visit trip actually at year 2013. You can see here, very recently we have got these pictures. Here also we can see those cracks very easily. But since I was engaging with the process engineering activities during this period, I was not interested with the chemical 
all the other facts of these cracks in concrete. I was, I didn't know actually uh, what is the concrete and what are the interesting behind that and which kind of reaction could happen, what are the chemical engineering aspects of concrete. But if I knew during that period, the picture will be different than this. Okay, so you can see here, this is the water level. Those are the cracks. You can clearly see underneath the water level, we can see those cracks. So here, the sufficient amount of moisture it needs. So on the top of the water level, we can't see that cracks. It means it doesn't have the required amount of moisture. So those are the ASR form. Here you can see this is a core sample we took from this uh, structure. You can see clearly around these aggregates, there are secondary uh, here, a gel form, and not only that, even aggregates also forming the, the ASR gel. Here you can see aggregates also getting forming the ASR gels. So, and this is research I have taken from Sintam Adams. She has, uh, did some study on the identification of some possibilities on the some risk areas that could generate more reactive aggregates and further studies also doing uh, by Professor Nanakar with uh, Dr. Kondo Singh from University of Jayadunku. Okay, so I have finished the, 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 the things that we have already done. Actually, what I want to emphasize is that how we can utilize multidisciplinary things in the concrete uh, subjects. So I will, there are some few slides to discuss about the future directions uh, on the concrete. One is that online measuring of the durability. So here, basically, there are some techniques currently we are utilizing, like uh, non-destructive test and some tests are destructive tests to evaluate the durability or strength properties of concrete. But now, nowadays, there are a lot of technologies are coming with the development of concrete, basically dealing with the multidiscipline, like electronic, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, and some other engineering aspects, like material engineering are coming to the picture. They are working together as one group to develop, to overcome few challenges that they are facing in the real world. This is one thing. Uh, they are utilizing now electrical resistance, introducing new uh, sensors to the concrete structures to evaluate how the resistance is getting changed. So with the change of resistance, you can see here, this is one kind of a research completed in University of Minho in USA, uh, sorry, uh, in USA, they did uh, some, they introduced some sort of uh, sensors to identify the electrical, the changes of the electrical resistivity with the time being and identify how ASR forming inside the concrete. So if we have such kind of a thing, we didn't want to, to experience such kind of things. There would be a, some, uh, there, there might have some kind of a uh, time period to identify those issues to address them quickly. So those are the things the engineering is coming. This is the one thing, the piezoelectric properties and resistivity to identify physical properties of concrete. I remember that during my university period in first year, we studied about the piezoelectricity. Piezoelectric materials means you can see here, if a one material, if I can strain, if I can change their dimensions, it generates voltage or it generates a current. Such kind of material we call piezoelectric materials. The property called we piezoelectricity. So the same kind of things we can utilize to, you can see here, this was done in uh, university, uh, in USA University. They, 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 their expectation was to evaluate the, there are some bridges, concrete bridges and concrete rods. So they wanted to evaluate the exact time that they can allow for high loads, high loading vehicles or heavy vehicles. For that, they put some piezoelectric materials, piezoelectric sensors uh, inside the concrete to evaluate the strength generator, uh, the strength uh, gaining patterns with the, with the evaluation of their conductances. So such kind of a things we can utilize. This is a, one research paper I have to the cement-based piezoelectric composite sensor for to identify the three-dimensional stress states in concrete. With that, we can identify real real time. We can identify the hydration process, their stiffness, the compress compressive strength gaining, and the durability parameters of concrete without putting extra efforts or extra time to evaluate those mechanisms. 
This is the one thing. Uh, there are a lot of research going with the self-healing concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that with the time, with the freezing and thawing, and with some kind of a mechanism like uh, like swing cages, there are possibility to have uh, cracks in concrete. But the engineering, different engineering disciplines are working to make those concrete self-heal without putting extra effort, without putting additional effort from externally. They are developing concrete that can withstand with those kind of a kind of phenomena. Usually they can develop with inorganic polymers and some research are dealing with biological reactions like yeast. They are putting yeast into the concrete. So yeast can generate carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide can react with calcium hydroxide to generate, to form calcium carbonate that those can fill some cracks and gaps and fly ash also acting like a self-healing material. So such kind of a different varieties of research and development from different disciplines are working together to overcome challenges in this. This is the one work which I am dealing uh, with my PhD studies with Dr. Suraj, Professor Nanaka and Professor Asamoto to develop non-zero cement concrete with the reaction mechanism of geopolymer concrete. So as we discussed previously, OPC, which is having hydraulic reaction. So geopolymer, it's a polymerization reaction. It doesn't have a reaction mechanism, such kind of reaction mechanism as we discussed previously. It have a very stable polymerized material. So the, the reaction mechanism is somewhat different. We have to utilize aluminum silicate material with alkaline activation. Then we can form very stable nanoscale material with uh, we call usually call uh, geopolymerization or geopolymer materials. This is one example I have taken to emphasize you that this is the complete strength of a one material that we have delivered. Actually, uh, I have not put any kind of design or material here because uh, this is a new finding to the world. So we are in the uh, process of IP generation patent. So that's why we did. It. That's why I didn't put any kind of uh, material properties here. Basically, uh, we have identified those are the compressive strength gaining with the FTIR. FTIR means Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. So with that. You can see it here it's mix number one, this is mix number two. Here also this is mix number one and mix number two. So we can evaluate the engineering know-how from material and chemical engineering disciplines to civil engineering. This is a civil engineering discipline. They are requirement in the macro level, they need strength. But we can, we can identify how we can develop the strength by changing the, 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 the polymerization mechanism or the or the other chemical engineering aspects. Here, by changing this one, we can get the optimum rather than two, such kind of a thing. So here, basically, it's a polymerization reaction having a cross-link step growth polymer. So don't think that much on this page. This is full of reactions. So you can see here that uh, the, the uh, basically the functional, functional groups this is basically with the functional group. And uh, we can deliver with that, starting from that concentration of, of functional groups, M, the, 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 the relationship between P means the, uh, the amount of reaction happen or the polymerization growth to the level of uh, chain length of the polymer. So basically, why so it, it means A equal to B, B equal to C, then A equal to C. It means we can control the chain length by changing the, the functional groups, the concentration of the functional groups. It means to do this kind of a geopolymerization processes, we can develop different kinds of materials by changing their concentrations. So if, if any kind of projects demanding for a different product, or a different kind of projects demanding a different product, very easily we can diff generate different kind of properties by changing their functional groups. So this is the way we can address to the requirements of civil engineering with approach of multidisciplinary. So, again, so here I will show something. So you can see this is the size of fly ash. 
this is those are in micro level and the silica film usually in the nano level and this is the geopolymer material size you can see it's, it's in the nano level basically so it's very stable it can stand against most exposure conditions like acid since it doesn't have a hydraulic reaction hydrated product like previously we discussed that uh, usual conventional concrete having is two of articles it doesn't have here because of that it is very good for fire applications so you can see by changing the the, the silicon and aluminum composition we can uh, generate concretes from even having a very high protection of fire protection to the even some some materials for aviation industry for spare parts for some jets or aerospace or things so this is the, the beauty of the engineering we have to utilize the engineering know how the ultimately what i want to say uh, beyond the strength and durability this is very recent study doing at usa and some european countries they are developing rechargeable cement based batteries just imagine that we are just imagine that all the roads are made with concrete that have a capability to 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 withstand or to 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 capture charges it means it's like acting like rechargeable battery all the suppose that all this all the bridges and all the roads are acting like a battery and now we have a technology to transfer electricity without wire it means wireless electricity tra transferring is possible then it's it's giving opportunity for engineers to to develop vehicles that can charge wirelessly while they are driving on a concrete road so this is the imagination and this is the way our engineering is going with concrete it's not just strength and durability there are more aspects are coming to the picture so what i want to emphasize is we always have to think about out of the box so if we can utilize engineering know how and aspirations we always can develop miracles to the world to make this world a better place for all all his species who lives in this earth so ultimately i want special thank professor anuruddha nayakar my he was the aspiration person actually for me to study about to utilize multi discipline ways in concrete technology and dr haris khurachi dr aruna manipur from university of peradeniya chemical engineering and specially engineering uh, mr tisalian again he is the person who uh, asked me to conduct this uh, session and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and the uh, chamila and all the chemical engineer sectional committee members of his bearers and the uh, isl publication committee and all public and private organization like irrigations uh, nbro and other private organizations who supported to develop knowledge and solutions and uh, my current organization mel sagama and in especially the place where i grow so thank you everybody uh, ultimately conclusion remarks i will take one research paper from uh, professor brugel he developed the the uh, theory called dream court to bridge theory and practice with the dedication responsibility expertise awareness and the models materials manufacturing with other coding curing controlling with proper organizations and multidisciplinary race with proper engineering know how we can or we will be able we will be able to develop a proper bridge to meet theories and practice so the final remarks is that multidisciplinary approach will be the most effective way to overcome future challenges in all industries not only the concrete so thank you it's time for questions you call in the uh, engineer call in the it was a very informative uh, lecture to uh, i think mostly it was uh, at least uh, civil engineering at least to me um uh, this was organized by the chemical engineering section committee because uh, calling the was very passion has a very passion for uh, composites and uh, concrete and so on so he phd is also in the towards the concrete uh so i i i think we have very limited time we can give uh, for one question if you have any questions we can give a 
you would say two minutes and we can give time for one question. If there is any question, please raise hand so that we can have, a, have one question. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. The, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, I was fascinated by the lecture, and, and uh, I, I'm calling from Sydney, and I myself a pavement engineer, rigid pavement engineer, building concrete roads here. So it's it's fascinating. I, I would say it's, it's first class lecture, and I, I'm very proud of proud to hear that lecture even. And um, yeah, thank you very much for that. And uh, my question is, I mean, uh, not from Kalinga, but those folks who are living there, um, our RDA specifications, concrete specifications, are not up to scratch, all right? So, so do we have a process to develop these things and put them in place so that at the at the operation level, when when we build roads and structures in Sri Lanka, um, we we have some kind of a uh, development process um, initiated. Um, so that our, our young engineers will get into the uh, habit of going back to the uni and studying more and, and developing those things are ultimately benefiting the society. That, that's my question. And it's fascinating. I, I would say I, I couldn't thank you more. And um, it, it's uh, inspiring. And uh, especially the concrete roads. Uh, well, so, thank you so much. Thank you. Colin, the please. Can you answer the question? Actually, uh, sorry, I just saw that person Anaka also here. Uh, so if you can add to that, would be very great. Professor Anaka. Professor Nanakar, are you uh, giving few words to the audience? I think uh, Professor Nanakar is, has not made any comment. So I think uh, we can conclude with that. I think uh, I will call upon uh, Mr. Tamil. Is it Tamil? Sorry. Um. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hear me now. Mr. Narakara, there is some uh, problem. I think uh, your signal is Mrs. I think uh, Nanaka is having some issue with this signal. Hello, Mrs. Lisa. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, 
I um I, I posted my my email address there. I mean, we can take the conversation offline. Uh, no, no problem. All right. Um, please, please um, go ahead. Okay, okay, sure. Actually, for, for just to add that one, uh, yes, yeah. there are some uh, critical issues we have identified. It's I think it's not ethical to say, but uh, some of the durability indications and the, uh, some conventional specifications and those things are used utilized still. And we have found out some of them. And even in 2000, if I'm correct, in 2019 period during the, 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 the process of uh, uh, Central Expressway and the process of New Canal Bridge, especially focusing the mass concrete and the chloride concentration and those aspects, we had some uh, critical evaluation on the aspects uh, and found out some kind of a mismatching with the state of the art techniques and the specifications. And uh, yes, they also know that. I think uh, I we hope that they will take uh, precautions and necessary actions to overcome such kind of uh, negative things in near future. We hope that uh, the country will have a proper specification. But most of the areas still we are lagging on this uh, the state of the art uh, or the performance based concrete specifications. Still we don't have for our country, but uh, we are doing more research uh, with the supervision of our. Uh, very high level of academics, especially for the are working, and Peradini also working some there, and Rohan also working. So we are doing a lot of engagement activities in the research and development to identify, to correlate the theories and the practical with our country's context. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Engineer uh, Kalin. I think Chamila, can you uh, give you a word of thanks, please? Yes, Engineer, sir. Uh, yeah. If the time is uh, flying, I will uh, make it short. Uh, Engineer Kalinda Dasanayaka, uh, thank you very much for conducting a uh, very informative presentation, especially how you explain uh, how we can link uh, chemical engineering principles like uh, transport phenomena, chemical kinetics, etc., into uh, uh, practical civil engineering aspects. Uh, so thanks again. And finally, I would like to thank those who participated from different different engineering disciplines uh, uh, in this lecture. And uh, we hope to conduct this, this kind of lectures in future as well. Uh, please stay with us. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.